hours. It is one month after the start of the Falklands War. Today, the British destroyer Sheffield is on radar scouting patrol here in the South Atlantic. She is the hottest air defense ship in the Royal Navy. Her radar is excellent. Her men are well trained. 300 miles away, a pair of French-made Super Etendard fighter bombers take off from the Argentine mainland and head toward the British fleet. Tucked under the wing of each plane is an Exocet AM-39 missile. There is nothing second-rate about these weapons. 50 miles out from the Sheffield, the Exocets are released and head on a collision course with the British destroyer. The missiles skim just above the wave tops as they streak toward the Sheffield at almost 700 miles an hour. At this height, they are almost undetectable. The ship's electronic countermeasures do reveal that a radar beam has locked onto Sheffield, but for some reason it is not identified as a missile, and the ship continues on its mission. At last, an officer sees the Exocet approaching, but it is too late. One of the two missiles slams into the Sheffield. Its warhead fails to detonate, but the missile's unused fuel sets off an inferno. 21 men die in a vain attempt to save the ship. Six days later, the charred and listing hulk of the destroyer will finally sink. The Sheffield disaster is a wake-up call for naval leaders around the world. Without a missing piece of the defensive puzzle, high-tech ships are sitting ducks. Armed with missiles like Exocet, even a Bush League enemy can kill you. The missing piece of the puzzle is stealth engineering. The proliferation and the increasing sophistication of anti-ship cruise missiles is, has been one of the, the big wake-up calls for naval architects and for navies alike. And if we look at incidents like the loss of HMS Sheffield, we can then see the potency that the modern sea-skimming anti-ship missile provides for a hostile force. The American Navy and her allies got the message of the Sheffield loud and clear. Push the boundaries of space-age technology to get ships off enemy radar screens. In short, make ships stealthy or die. The direct result of this wake-up call is a whole new generation of naval vessels, stealth ships, which are now in deployment or already deployed at sea. They are ships that can hide as well as they fight. They look different and perform different, but all share the same means of survival. They seek to make themselves invisible to the enemy. America's Arleigh Burke destroyers have eliminated even the smallest shapes that can attract missiles. The Norwegian Shoal races over the water on a cushion of air and with a startling form that can deflect enemy search radar. The sleek lines of the Swedish Visby class are created not with steel, but with non-magnetic carbon fiber panels, perfect for avoiding the menace of floating mines. The German Mako frigate vents its exhaust under the ship to avoid smokestacks that attract heat-seeking weapons. But such ships are only the opening moves in a deadly game of stealth. The future will bring radically different ideas to the world's navies. The British Sea Wraith may bathe its hull and decks in water to eliminate heat that can reveal its position. And the amazing sea shadow has already shown the American Navy how future designs may use radically different hull shapes to stay alive. Modern missiles, mines, and torpedoes have ratcheted up the threat to men of war. But the challenge of applying stealth technology to ships is as old as warships themselves. The sea is a featureless surface. It's not a, uh, not got terrain, not got hills or valleys or, or forest to hide in or swamps or mountains. Some early warships used fog banks to stalk their prey. In the 5th century BC, a Greek fleet hid behind an island to successfully spring a trap on a stronger Persian fleet at the Battle of Salamis. But tricks that work with weapons such as arrows or smoothbore cannon don't cut it in a world of modern weapons. By the time the 20th century rolls around, ships are changing. We clearly have long-range guns, guns that can fire out to the end of the horizon, in fact, even just over the horizon. 
As the world plunged into war in 1914, England and later America turned to camouflage paint schemes to fool the Germans' big guns and U-boats. Instead of seeing the nice, neat outline of a ship, you wanted him to see all sorts of shapes and lines, black and white, so that he wouldn't know quite which way the ship was going or where the bow was. He needed that information in order to estimate the speed of the ship to launch his torpedo. World War I also saw another form of stealth deception by the Allied forces, Q-ships. These gunboats masqueraded as unarmed merchantmen until a U-boat surfaced to kill. Then their hidden deck guns opened fire on the unsuspecting sub. This early form of stealth sent 11 U-boats to the bottom. During World War II, camouflage continued to play an important part in disrupting enemy submarine attacks. But it was an older stealth technique that proved critical to survival of the American fleet at the world's last great naval surface battle, Leyte Gulf. In October 1944, Japanese battleships crept through the Philippine Straits to pounce on a lightly defended force of small American escort carriers. Only a few U.S. destroyers stood between the carriers and the bottom of the Leyte Gulf. The outnumbered destroyers lay down a smoke screen that would avert disaster for the American ships. The much weaker American force is able to make a run on the surface over a two and a half hour engagement, even though they are radically overmatched. A really splendid example of the use of stealth and concealment to protect a force on the surface. But one huge technological breakthrough during World War II would change forever the nature and importance of stealth tactics. By the mid-1930s, British scientists had produced the first practical radar system. By 1939, England had established a chain of radar stations along its coast to defend against German bombers. And radar was soon being installed on British and American warships. When radar came onto the scene in the late 1930s, it totally changed naval warfare. If you think of a way a warship works, somebody standing on the deck can perhaps see 13 or 14 miles with a pair of binoculars. With radar, you can see 60, 70, 100 miles. And of course, later on, when you start putting radar on airplanes, you can see much, much further, several hundred miles away. By the 1970s, the Soviet Navy was the largest in the world. Its ships bristled with radar-guided missiles, and new technologies were joining radar to offer new threats to ships at sea. Advanced sonar, magnetic imaging, and infrared detectors created new and devastating sensors that could direct missiles to targets. By the 1980s, American naval architects were working on a stealth warship that would counter enemy radar. The Air Force was already creating stealth designs that would ultimately become the B-2 bomber and the F-117 attack aircraft. Making a 65-foot-long airplane invisible to radar was feasible. But the Navy's challenge would prove more difficult. The problems of building a stealthy warship 10 times as long and weighing 9,000 tons challenged the imagination of designers. The lives of future sailors would depend on building new warships that can sail in safety behind the protection of stealth. The British Type 45 is the first warship to include email and entertainment systems within the mess decks. It is also the first Royal Navy vessel to include gender-neutral living spaces to accommodate male and female crew members. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. We now return to Stealth and Beyond, Sea Stealth on Modern Marvels. As the 1980s passed, the U.S. Navy frantically searched for stealth technology that could counter the super-sensitive sensors of their Cold War rival, the Soviet Union. The new ships on the drawing boards would need to be the most powerful and lethal in naval history. As important, they would need to rely on revolutionary stealth designs to protect them. But in 1991, a new Russian revolution changed the rules of the game in naval warfare overnight. By the late 90s, 
much of Russia's navy lay abandoned or helplessly tied to their peers for lack of money. The worldwide threat of Russia on the high seas was history. With the end of the Cold War, the mission of America's Navy would undergo strategic changes. A dramatic shift away from deep sea military activity has made the stealth race more critical than ever. What we've seen in the last 15 years is that a wholesale shift away from the open ocean blue water standoff that was there between the former Soviet Navy and the US and, and its NATO allies. And what we see now is the whole shift of, of maritime operations moving into the near land areas or, or what we call the littoral area. The term littoral refers to waters bordering coastal regions, straits, bays, gulfs, and small seas are now the object of U.S. naval strategy. These littoral regions may range from half a mile to a hundred miles offshore. The Navy's evolving mission in these shallower inshore areas include air operations, cargo delivery, gunfire support, mine clearing, and the support of special operations like SEAL Team landings. The threat of going mano a mano with hundreds of Soviet warships may have vanished. But pulling off new missions in these littoral waters presents new threats from countries with even the weakest of navies. Terrorists in small rubber boats can now threaten our greatest warships, as evidenced by the attack on the USS Cole in October 2000. Those countries do have the ability to inflict great damage through what were unconventional means 20 years ago. Small boat swarm attacks on airships, coastal missile sites with coastal radar sites that, if you operate in the blue water, cannot reach you. But now when you have to take the fight into littorals, then you have to come within range of some of those systems. Now, even relatively poor nations can afford deadly radar and missile technologies that dangerously litter global weapons markets. The obstacles to building truly stealthy ships are well known. All ships moving through the water present signals or tracks of their presence. These tracks are called signatures. The most obvious signature is the shape of the ship itself. With nothing to hide behind, this outline is what is detected by the search beam of radar and is called a ship's radar cross-section or its radar signature. What people think of when the word stealth is mentioned is the appearance of the ship, and that's the shaping of the ship to reduce its radar signature. Minimizing this signature or cross-section can be the difference between surviving and dying from a missile attack. Until recently, most warships made inviting targets for radar. The sides of the hull, the bulkheads and funnels were all built at 90 degrees to the water, perfect geometric shapes to bounce a radar beam directly back to an attacking missile. Sailors who served in them were unaware, but these ships were actually inviting a deadly attack. This is the model of the USS Spruance, the lead ship of the DD-963 class. It was designed in the 70s. Consequently, you see a lot of examples on this ship that are bad for radar reflectivity and bad for ra reduced radar cross-section. The exterior bulkheads run vertically. They hit the main weather deck at a 90-degree angle, creating a shape all the way along the intersection of the superstructure and the deck that is almost a perfect reflector for radars. The intakes for the turbines that are below in the engine room are covered by louvers which have a design like open slats in the Venetian blind. That allows radar to get inside of the large air management system of this ship and reflect back in an almost perfect fashion to any homing missile that's seeking this ship out with radar. Radar cross-section isn't the only signature that betrays a ship's position. Modern infrared sensors rely not on radar waves, but on heat to reveal their prey. A steel ship on the water because of its engines, because of its heating system, all combine to give a thermal signature, a heat signature to that ship. 
and of course the engines have exhaust. You also have reflected heat. In sunlight, a metal shape will reflect heat. They're means of detecting that heat by infrared. One of the trickiest problems to overcome in building a stealthy ship is sound. All ships make noise as they move through the water, and noise in warfare can kill. Water is an excellent conductor of sound. A ship's machinery, particularly the propeller shafts running through the ship, send powerful sound waves to those who might be tracking her. Propellers also broadcast a ship's presence. The problem with propellers is, is that they, when they're uh, going at high speed, they do what is called cavitate, which is basically bubbles exploding on the tips of the propellers. Propellers also create a large wake. This mass of bubbles floats in the water for miles behind the ship. They form a pathway that can be spotted by satellite, and that can also guide a speeding torpedo directly to its target. All of these signatures combine to transform ships into perfect targets. As sensors have increased in power and the weapons they control in deadly effectiveness, new ways to survive at sea are being sought. In a moment, we will enter a whole new world of maritime technology. It is a world that is creating new shapes, new ships, and new ideas for a stealthy future at sea. The U.S. Navy's Littoral Combat Ship, or LCS, is designed specifically for coastal defense missions. The LCS is able to operate in less than 13 feet of water, giving it access to thousands of more ports and coastal waters worldwide. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. We now return to Stealth and Beyond, Sea Stealth on Modern Marvels. She may look like a stealth fighter plane or something out of Star Wars, but she is a United States naval vessel. She is 162 feet long and cruises at 13 knots. But this remarkable prototype is like no other in the Navy. Her deck is empty of sailors. Her bridge lacks a steering wheel, and she sails with no superstructure or rudders. Her name is Sea Shadow, and she is turning stealth theory into reality. She is not often photographed up close, but we are getting a rare look at one of the first of a new generation of stealthy ships. Her eerie shape and remarkable propulsion and steering systems break the mold on how Navy warships of the future will look and operate. Sea Shadow certainly is different than any other Navy vessel. Uh, there are a couple of reasons that drive that. The reason for sloping the sides is to reflect the radar energy away. It's similar to taking a flashlight and shining it in a mirror. If you tilt the mirror back and shine a light at it, then it goes off in another direction. Sea Shadow has been used as a research platform to test stealth hull designs for reducing a ship's dangerous vulnerability to radar detection. Her unique hull has offered up data that will be incorporated in stealth warships to come. Her radically angled sides shed radar waves like water, and in spite of her futuristic shape, Sea Shadow is extremely seaworthy. The reason the Sea Shadow is very stable is because of its swath hull form. Swath stands for small water plane area twin hull. And what we're talking about there is that the narrow struts that you see coming down from the sides are really quite thin where they pass through the surface of the water. And you end up with a much more stable ship than you would with a conventional monohull. As you can see, back by the propeller, there's no conventional rudder as we have on most ships. Sea Shadow uses a series of four fins. These Stabilizers back aft and a pair of canards forward, angling those up and down does the same function as the rudder does. Sea Shadow is driven by electric motors that are quieter than conventional propulsion and help to lower her acoustic signature. The crew has no need to be on deck, eliminating the requirement for lifelines that quickly register on enemy radar. We're here on the bridge of Sea Shadow. This is where the ship is operated from. Due to its high amount of automation, it actually is operated with only three people here on the bridge. From the console over to my right here is the engineering console. On a conventional Navy ship, a number of people are required to monitor 
simple things such as engines, reduction gears, the electrical generators. On Sea Shadow, one person can monitor all of those functions and more just through the power of the computer and the sensors that we have installed on board here. We have learned a lot from Sea Shadow and we continue to learn all the time. Uh, the lessons that we're learning they expect will lead us uh, to new platforms. By building Sea Shadow, the Navy had more freedom to go off and explore more radical ideas and try out new ideas to see how effective they can be at helping to protect our ships. Sea Shadow was built only as a test platform, but she has broken numerous technological barriers and put into practice advanced stealth concepts such as underwater hulls, new propulsion, and advanced engineering. They will change forever the way we design warships. But we don't have to wait for the future to discover stealthier ships that can fool enemy sensors. One warship is already using stealth to stay out of harm's way. The DDG-51 guided missile destroyer is one of the world's most advanced and dynamic stealth warships. The class is named after World War II's most famous destroyer commander, Admiral Arleigh Burke. Powerful gas turbines drive the 500-foot-long Burke-class destroyers through the water at speeds of over 30 knots. Their advanced Aegis combat system includes the most powerful air search radar in the world. Burke is an arsenal of immense firepower, equipped with 96 vertically launched anti-aircraft and Tomahawk cruise missiles. She also carries anti-ship missiles as well as torpedoes. Her 5-inch gun is capable of pulverizing targets over 60 miles inland. A Burke-class destroyer has all the weapons needed to kill any attacker that flies, swims, or threatens on land. But the most striking feature of the Burke-class destroyers is that they are the first American warships to actively try to do something about vulnerability to enemy sensors. We have principally used the shaping of the topside components in, in, in this ship to achieve uh, lower radar cross-section. The bulkheads on the exterior of this ship are, none of them are vertical. They're all sloped relative to the center line of the ship or to the outboard profile of the ship. Radar singles out a target primarily by its size. In the inshore littoral waters that are the focus of naval planning for the future, it isn't necessary to become invisible to radar. If a ship can misdirect a searching radar beam, it will change the way it is perceived on enemy radar. The destroyer will look like the tugboats or fishing boats or merchant vessels that might surround it. Here's just an example of what it looks like on the radar screen when one of the blips is a large vessel and which is usually the key that someone uses when they're trying to find you or attack you. The next screen you see a radar cross-section reduced blip where the big one used to be and when you see that the um, other blips on the screen those that came from wave tops or fishing boats or small freighters suddenly become as inviting a target as that big one used to be. That gives you a real problem if you're trying to find the Arleigh class destroyer or if you're trying to attack it, because now you have to get close enough perhaps to use your eyes in order to know what the target is. Once it is forced to get close, an attacking plane or missile is within range of the stunning array of weapons aboard Burke destroyers. Integrating stealth technology into the Arleigh Burke destroyer has been one of the most ambitious shipbuilding programs in history. In a moment, we will take an exclusive look inside this stealth project, which promises to revolutionize how we build, deploy, and defend our ships at sea. Construction of Sea Shadow was so secret, it took place inside a barge anchored off the coast of Southern California. Testing was conducted at night, with the barge keeping the ship under cover during daylight hours. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. We now return to Stealth and Beyond, Sea Stealth on Modern Marvels. For more than a hundred years, warships have been built with straight sides, perfectly vertical superstructures, and right angles where the bulkheads hit the deck. Just the kind of ship enemy radar loves. 
the Arleigh Burke class of destroyers set out to break the conventional mold by turning its designer's far-fetched dreams into reality, making a 9,000-ton warship that can hide as a small fishing boat is no easy task. It requires fresh thinking and innovative techniques. The first was to put her together like a giant set of children's blocks. There's actually 25 uh, major assemblies that make up the Arleigh Burke class destroyer. So what we do is we take these individual assemblies and piece them together into larger assemblies and we transport them down to the 600 area, which I'll show you next. The next stage of construction, the stealthy lines of the Burke class begin to take shape. We're down in the, uh, the lower part of the shipyard we call the 500-600 area. This is where we actually erect the ship and piece it together. What you see here is the uppermost part of the ship we call the superstructure. And here is where you start seeing the specific angles that are of, of, of importance in terms of signature reduction. Obviously the higher the ship is exposed up out of the water, the more concentrated you want to be in terms of, of lowering the signature. Flat sides and right angles are not the only shapes that can bounce radar waves directly back to an attacker. Round or cylindrical shapes can be deadly as well. One of the shapes that we really don't like on board a ship is a cylinder, like one of these. Cylinders are bad because no matter where you are, on the horizon, from whatever direction, the cylinder always returns energy directly to you. So instead of taking these stacks, which is what these are for this ship, and putting them outside on top, as they have been in classic designs, we're now going to put them up in this structure. Here they'll fit up inside that deckhouse piece, on top of those little mixing tubes that you see. And then the stacks will be used to mix the hot air out of the engine exhaust with cold air it sucks in through those big openings shoot it out the top of the stack we cool our IR exhaust so that we don't have an IR signature issue once this this structure is primed and painted out we lift it up with this crane and then stack it up on top of the ship the next we'll move around to the side Now you can see the finished form of a ship. This, this is a ship fully out, outfitted, fully erected, ready for translation onto the pontoon and launching. Ships are no longer launched in the traditional manner by sliding down the ways into the water. Today, the stealth destroyer is jacked up and carried onto a floating barge. The barge will be flooded and the final finishing of the ship's interior will begin. One of the newest members of the Burke class will be the USS Pinckney. The ship is named for Navy Cook First Class William Pinckney, recipient of the Navy Cross for rescuing a shipmate at the Battle of Santa Cruz in the Pacific in World War II. Commander Joe Kanicki is the project officer for the new vessel. Good morning. Welcome aboard the guided missile destroyer Pinckney. This is the newest ship of the United States Navy. It'll be commissioned in about two or three months. I'd like to take you on a tour and show you some of the stealth features that we have on board this ship. Can you please follow me? We'll start by showing you some of the major design features of the Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer. On previous U.S. Navy warships, the superstructures were designed as flat-sided pieces of equipment. However, in this design, we have the ship angles set over uh, at an optimum angle to avoid radar. The silhouette of the Pinckney and others of her class reveal the sloping sides of her superstructure and funnels. These sides change her radar cross-section and bounce radar waves harmlessly away from the ship. But in early tests, it soon became apparent that small objects on the deck could also betray the ship to radar. Ladders, pipes, light fixtures, even round lifeline stanchions were redesigned to fight off enemy detection. As a radar beam approaches, uh, due to the different angles that we have on this stanchion, as it hits, it bounces off in either direction or above. It's not reflected back to the source. This drastically reduces the radar cross-section of the stanchion. Oftentimes, it's the smallest things that make the largest difference. 
In the case of a circular dogging wrench, and a dogging wrench is typically used to gain leverage on a door, as I'm demonstrating here. But these dogging wrenches on all previous ships have been round, and we found are very large reflectors of radar energy. On this particular ship, you can see that they're angled to scatter the radar energy so they won't be a reflector. If you'll follow me up to the next deck. As we're going up this ladder, I'd like to point out to you that there's also some design features for all topside ladders. If you'll notice on the deck treads, there's no 90 degree angles. The supports are canted outward at a little bit larger than 90 degree angles. Also, the handrails uh, employ the same type of diamond design to reduce the radar cross-section. Even something as small as the bits used to tie up the ship to the pier can become dangerous reflectors of radar energy. For hundreds of years, bits have been cylinders straight up and down out of the deck. We've redesigned these uh, bits to have an hourglass shape more favorable to achieve the stealth targets we are aiming at on this ship. But for all the attention to minor details, the toughest stealth challenges remained the big structures on the ship. Prior to the Burke-class destroyer, ship's masts were built of large round pipes or columns, perfect reflectors for a radar searching for a target to home in on. This is the main mast for the DDG-51. This is the main mast trunk. A traditional mast is designed and built with cylinders or tubes that are pretty much vertical. We needed to eliminate those on the DDG, so we went after something that was non-traditional. This flat side looks like it caused a problem, but when we put it on the ship, we actually tip it. And once it's tipped, now I have a flat side that sends the energy away from a radar receiver. Let's go take a look at what the finished product looks like. Here then is our finished product. Over in the yard we saw the pieces laying on the ground. Now you see them erected as a radically different mast than we saw on any other ship in the past. We've got the square tube in the center. It's shaped. It's tipped back. So now it looks just like the kind of shapes that we want to take to sea for radar control. We're very proud of the ship that's been constructed. It represents the best of American ingenuity. It's designed to take its crew into battle, defeat the enemy, and bring our sailors home safely. But for all their advances, the Burke-class destroyers are just a preview of what's to come. The future promises radically new designs that will push the look and performance of fighting ships to a new level of stealth and sophistication. When we return, Engineers give us a unique look into the future of stealth ships around the world. Ships that look different, handle different, and fight different. Taking warship design where it has never gone before. Besides their stealth capabilities, the advanced materials used on the Arleigh Burke-class destroyers are also designed to shield the crew from biological or chemical attack. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. We now return to Stealth and Beyond, Sea Stealth on Modern Marvels. America's Arleigh Burke guided missile destroyers are among the most sophisticated and powerful weapons of war ever created. But they represent only the beginnings of what lies ahead for stealth technology. On the banks of the River Elba in Hamburg, Germany, the Blommen Voss shipyard has been creating ships of all kinds for almost 130 years. It was here that the legendary battleship Bismarck was completed in 1940 and sent off to a rendezvous with the British fleet. And it is here that one of the world's stealthiest new ships is being built for the South African Navy, the Mako-class A200 frigate. She is 360 feet long and will drive through the water at just under 30 knots. But to an enemy's radar, she looks like a cod boat. To so dramatically reduce this A200's radar cross-section, the Germans have chosen a radically unique hull design. This new stealth ship is shaped like an X. A major design principle within the Miko Blom and Foss ships uh, is the uh, reduction of the radar cross-section by the so-called X-shape. The X-shape is a way of tilting the superstructure of the vessel in order to deflect the incoming radiation. 
Like the U.S., German designers are concerned about the infrared signature given off by heat escaping from the exhaust funnels. Infrared sensors can read this heat many miles from the ship. The Germans have solved the problem of hot funnels by eliminating them completely. As you can see here, we have no funnel. We have guided our exhaust direct underneath the water line or direct via the stern to cool the exhaust gases with uh, the seawater and get cool infrared and no hot spot. The Blumenvoss shipyard, like most in the world, continues to make ships from steel. But just across the Baltic Sea from Germany, the Swedes and Norwegians are pioneering the construction of high-tech ships made from a space-age material that is creating a revolution in stealth design. One of the results is the Swedes' stunning new class of warship called Fisby. Named after a Swedish city, this sleek and speedy corvette not only looks different than any other in the world, it is also made differently. Its hull is formed not from steel, but from two-inch thick carbon fiber panels. Although they look like fiberglass foam insulation used in home construction, these panels are extremely tough, yet very lightweight, and they are proving to rival steel in their resistance to damage. Composite is, is built up uh, around the core of uh, rigid foam of PVC. It's stiff, rigid, and doesn't uh, absorb water. Uh, on each side of that core, we, we apply laminate. And the laminate is uh, a combination of fibers of glass, and in the Visp case, it's, it's carbon fiber. The carbon fiber laminate is glued onto the foam panels with vacuum pressure. Then the finished panels are cut to size with a high-pressure water jet. Much cooler, much easier than steel. The composite has been used to form the Visby into a stunningly original stealth shape with angles that can bounce threatening radar signals away from the ship. The exterior of the ship is completely clean. Nothing is allowed topside to betray Visby to an enemy's radar. Visby's designers are aware that the sensor of the future may not be radar. Visby is powered by water jet propulsion that offers less noise for acoustic weapons to home in on. And special attention has been paid to eliminating heat to avoid infrared detection. The Swede's success is amazing. Above is an infrared targeting image of a conventional ship. Below is the heat image of Visby. Visible. The whole idea with the, with the stealth uh, philosophy on VSP is to reduce the detection range uh, significantly, in many cases 50% or 70%, that allows the commander to uh, decide if he wants to shoot or hide or wait or go into some other mode of operation. Another Scandinavian country is also pushing the envelope of stealth design. On a dramatic coastline, cut by narrow fjords and dotted with hundreds of islands, a new class of stealth ship lies waiting to defend Norway. Her name is Shoal, Norwegian for shield, and this seagoing speedster is something special. Shoal is driven by water jets at an incredible speed of over 50 knots. Just like the Swedes Visby class, she is built of lightweight composite, and her hull and superstructure are also smooth and angled, offering a poor target for enemy radar. Shoal rides over the water on an air-cushioned catamaran hull. This uh, new ship, compared to a conventional hull, has a lot of advantages. It has much higher speed. It has uh, better sea-keeping performances. This ship is uh, hard to detect on a radar because it's uh, built by stealth principles. But all of these innovative vessels offer only a hint of what stealthy warships may look like in the future. Work is already underway in the U.S. Navy to create a whole new generation of stealthy vessels. Leading the way will be a revolutionary ship that today is known only as the DDX. DDX will look unlike any other ship ever built. A radically slanting hull will deflect radar. Her decks will be barren of anything that could give away her presence. No sailor will normally be allowed on deck. 
For most of her crew, life aboard will be like serving in a submarine. Missiles will be dispersed and hidden in the ship's sides. Her mast will be stealthily concealed inside a sleek superstructure. DDX will be propelled by electric motors that give off considerably less noise to betray the new ship's position. The first DDX is expected to join the U.S. fleet in 2013. One of her missions will be to work close to shore to offer gunfire support to land forces. In future planning, Marines will be dropped behind enemy lines with lightning speed. To do this, they will carry less of their own artillery and rely more on the guns of DDX. Guns that are as stealthy as they are devastating. The barrel of the 155 millimeter gun is hidden until it rises to blast 10 shells a minute over 100 miles. Once fired, satellites will guide the shells to their target with an accuracy measured in yards. When finished firing, the barrel again hides from radar detection. DDX will be so highly automated that she will be crewed by as few as 125 sailors, less than half that required by today's ships of her size. The Navy is also developing a close relative of DDX, the Littoral Combat Ship, or LCS. Three companies are currently competing to design this radically new ship. If built, LCS will engage in anti-submarine patrols, mine countermeasures, and launching and recovering secret special ops teams, such as SEALs. LCS will sail into battle at speeds of up to 50 knots and will be as stealthy as any ship in the world. Both DDX and the Latoro combat ship will lead us to a whole new world of stealthy warships. Amphibious landing ships, the ugly ducklings of the old Navy, will feature stealthy shaped masts and smooth surfaces. SEAL teams will sneak ashore riding in a stealthy underwater delivery vehicle. When their mission is completed, it will carry them back to a mother submarine. It is safe to say that in the Navy of the future, most ships will be dominated by stealth technology. Shapes will remind you some of uh, spacecraft perhaps is the best term. But if you look at airplanes, you get a good idea of where we're going with ships. And for the future, I think you'll see that same sort of transition in the shape of ships. I'm not sure I can visualize the actual shape of a warship in a hundred years' time, but I can tell you some of the things it will be. It will be submersible. I think that all warships will be capable of going under the surface. I think it will be fast. I think it will be cost-effective. In other words, it will have a propulsion system which will allow it to stay at sea longer. I think it will have fewer crew. Ships may become fully automated, sailing across oceans and carrying out their missions with no crew at all. Use of lightweight composites and hull designs, such as catamarans, trimarans, and surface effects, will allow ships to hit speeds of almost 100 knots. Whatever their size or mission, warships will possess new levels of stealth capability that will make them increasingly hard to detect. But as research continues on stealth, so too does research on ways to beat it. So you've always got this balance of trying to get more stealthy, trying to get better sensors, or exploit another signature. And this has been the nature of warfare. Uh, swords, they develop shields to protect themselves from it. And now it's you build a better missile or a more stealthy ship, the other side is going to look for countermeasures to it. The dangerous game of cat and mouse will continue as warships search for ways to elude enemy detection with invisibility. And many of the answers will continue to be found in new technology, offering a chance for the greatest of human weapons.
reflect enemy search radar. The sleek lines of the Swedish Visby class are created not with steel, but with non-magnetic carbon fiber panels, perfect for avoiding the menace of floating mines. The German Mako frigate vents its exhaust under the ship to avoid smokestacks that attract heat-seeking weapons. But such ships are only the opening moves in a deadly game of stealth. The future will bring radically different ideas to the world's navies. The British Sea Wraith may bathe its hull and decks in water to eliminate heat that can reveal its position. And the amazing Sea Shadow has already shown the American Navy how future designs may use radically different hull shapes to stay alive. Modern missiles, mines, and torpedoes have ratcheted up the threat to men of war. But the challenge of applying stealth technology to ships is as old as warships themselves. The sea is a featureless surface. It's not a, uh, not got terrain. Not hours. It is one month after the start of the Falklands War. Today, the British destroyer Sheffield is on radar scouting patrol here in the South Atlantic. She is the hottest air defense ship in the Royal Navy. Her radar is excellent. Her men are well trained. 300 miles away, a pair of French-made Super Etendard fighter bombers take off from the Argentine mainland and head toward the British fleet. Tucked under the wing of each plane is an Exocet AM-39 missile. There is nothing second-rate about these weapons. 50 miles out from the Sheffield, the Exocets are released and head on a collision course with the British destroyer. The missiles skim just above the wave tops as they streak toward the Sheffield at almost 700 miles an hour. At this height, they are almost undetectable. The ship's electronic countermeasures do reveal that a radar beam has locked onto Sheffield, but for some reason it is not identified as a missile, and the ship continues on its mission. At last, an officer sees the Exocet approaching, but it is too late. One of the two missiles slams into the Sheffield. Its warhead fails to detonate, but the missile's unused fuel sets off an inferno. 21 men die in a vain attempt to save the ship. Six days later, the charred and listing hulk of the destroyer will finally sink. The Sheffield disaster is a wake-up call for naval leaders around the world. Without a missing piece of the defensive puzzle, high-tech ships are sitting ducks. Armed with missiles like Exocet, even a Bush League enemy can kill you. The missing piece of the puzzle is stealth engineering. The proliferation and the increasing sophistication of anti-ship cruise missiles is, has been one of the, the big wake-up calls for naval architects and for navies alike. And if we look at incidents like the loss of HMS Sheffield, we can then see the potency that the modern sea-skimming anti-ship missile provides for a hostile force. The American Navy and her allies got the message of the Sheffield loud and clear, pushed the boundaries of space-age technology to get ships off enemy radar screens. In short, make ships stealthy or die. The direct result of this wake-up call is a whole new generation of naval vessels, stealth ships, which are now in deployment or already deployed at sea. They are ships that can hide as well as they fight. They look different and perform different, but all share the same means of survival. They seek to make themselves invisible to the enemy. America's Arleigh Burke destroyers have eliminated even the smallest shapes that can attract missiles. The Norwegian Shoal races over the water on a cushion of air and with a startling form that can defy got hills or valleys or, or forests to hide in or swamps or mountains. Some early warships used fog banks to stalk their prey. In the 5th century BC, a Greek fleet hid behind an island to successfully spring a trap on a stronger Persian fleet at the Battle of Salamis. But tricks that work with weapons such as arrows or smoothbore cannon don't cut it in a world of modern weapons. By the time the 20th century rolls around, ships are changing. We clearly have long-range guns, guns that can fire out to the end of the horizon, in fact, even just over the horizon. 
As the world plunged into war in 1914, England and later America turned to camouflage paint schemes to fool the Germans' big guns and U-boats. Instead of seeing the nice, neat outline of a ship, you wanted him to see all sorts of shapes and lines, black and white, so that he wouldn't know quite which way the ship was going or where the bow was. He needed that information 